Yes, they are sick and tired of the Tibetan resistance, and they, I'm sure they do understand that the nomads, uh, in a purely sort of passive way, have actually been very capable of resistance simply by having more children than they're allowed to, and often cadres would be physically afraid to go out onto the grasslands uh, where they're outnumbered by the nomads and actually you know, check how many children you've got uh, and whether you're actually exceeding the limits. Uh, but on, so on paper, the number of children you could have, the number of animals you could have, the amount of land you're supposed to have were all sort of regulated. But in reality, um, you know, nomads could always, you know, hide a few animals up a long winding valley. And so in that sense, we could say that, you know, this crisis has partly come about because of the a long history of passive resistance by nomads just simply ignoring China's message, partly because it was incomprehensible to them, literally incomprehensible because it was in a language that Tibetans don't speak, it was all in Chinese and not translated, uh, but also because it's full of Chinese Communist Party jargon and slogans and things that people are meant to know, but in reality actually you know, are quite meaningless to people on the ground. So for a whole host of reasons, well, I think we should credit the nomads with quite successful resistance. Mm. But I think the third factor that explains why they're doing it right now, rather than say 10, 20, 30 years ago, is that they have been persuaded by the scientists that degradation is you know, serious and that, it, uh, that the nomads are the cause. And that's a big stretch and you know, some groups did say, what is the real cause of degradation? You know, that's a big issue, but I think in a nutshell, all of China's statistics uh, and some of the quotes from that man in the biosphere uh, publication that was being quoted at yesterday's conference also said the same thing. During the 1960s and 1970s, when nomads were completely powerless, all of their animals, all of their land was collectivized into these sort of huge political organizations with Chinese cadres in charge, they felt you know, they can intensify production and produce much more meat. I mean, these nomads are clearly backward and unscientific. We know how to intensify meat production. Herd sizes increased enormously. The nomads couldn't do anything about it. The moment they did get some uh, control over their own lives, back again in the early 80s, herd sizes of Chinese statistics, particularly sheep, dropped by as much as 25%, which is a good sign that the nomads knew all along that the land of Tibet was being pushed harder than it can bear. And that is the source of the degradation. And that unfortunately, because of the extreme climate in Tibet, once the roots of plants are killed, it just eats away like a cancer and the eroded areas just grow bigger and bigger because they, they're subjected to gales and blizzards and, and uh, uh, nobody did anything about it. And it's a legacy of the last 50 years you know, in, in development terms, it's called a policy mistake or a, a policy failure, which is the polite term for it, uh, which of course China has never acknowledged because as we know, China never acknowledges all sorts of past policy mistakes and policy failures such as the Tiananmen massacre and a few other minor events that uh, we don't like to talk about. Uh, so there is no possibility in China that the scientists can actually reach as a scientific conclusion the origin of this problem is policy mistakes, terrible policy mistakes were made in the 60s and 70s. So I've tried to answer yeah, a few great. points that's in great. one hit.